Welcome to Monwar Recaps, spoilers ahead, watch out, and take care. Huge shout out and special thanks to the channel members. The Monwa starts by introducing us to Xinye County, specifically the Young Manor. We see an elf checking a baby's pulse and then lets out a sigh of relief. The father asks how his son is, and the elf says it will be hard for the baby to live past 20 years old, as that's the type of constitution he has. We learn the father is the patriarch of the Young family, and his name is Deem Young. He asks if it's punishment from the heavens because he's a child that caused his mother to die due to birth. The elf looks annoyed and can't believe he's asking his physician that. He asks how he could say that to one of his own children, specifically one that will die young. He explains that it's similar to the nine yin severed meridians, and never in his life has he seen anybody with their upper acupoint open to such an extreme. The elf continues explaining that if the Bai Hu acupoint is too open, one will die soon. People usually call that deity ascension. Deem Young asks if he means the thing Taoists that are very powerful do when they depart for the heavenly realm. The elf asks why he believes that nonsense, and he doesn't know if he's heard of absolute martial masters using the upper meridians of their heads, but that's them using the Baihu acupoints. That is the so-called deity ascension. When somebody gets too drunk on the energy of the great nature that came from the heavens and earth and dies because they could not withstand it, Deem Young glances down at his son, who looks super cheery, and then he stands up and begins to walk away saying it seems that he's right and that this is heavenly punishment. The elf asks how he could call himself a father, and Deem Young tells him it's time for him to leave and he'll get the chief stewardess to pass his pay to him. The elf says that he doesn't need it and walks away hella angry. He says that if he had grown up in the unorthodox sect or the demonic faction, he would have become the heavenly demon. If he had grown up in the Shaolin Temple, he would have been able to use the 72 elite training methods of the Shaolin Temple two times over but yet he was born as a hated child in a place unbefitting of his talents, and he'll die in the countryside young without any way to survive. He tips his hat to the stars, saying unless he achieves enlightenment on his own, that is. About two decades later, at the Young Manor, Deem Young has aged considerably. He says ever since his deceased father, a disciple of the Zhongnan sect, Sam Jiomja, founded this clan, he's dedicated his whole life to focus on the revival. If their clan becomes famous throughout the world, he will have inherited the ultimate technique of the Zhongnan sect, so he does not plan to close down the business. He's really glad that at least his son followed in his deceased father's footsteps and managed to join the Zhongnan sect. Everybody starts congratulating one of the sons for his achievement, and Deem Young tells everybody to raise their glasses. One of the sons looks around and says that Yongshan isn't here yet, and Deem Young looks annoyed, saying that he told him to stay at the training ground, as it's better for him to not be here when it is such a joyous occasion, as he would bring ill omens. The man looks worried that his brother, is being treated like this. In the training hall, we see a blue aura, and the baby from the start has now grown up, and he is practicing martial arts. A wave of energy swirls up from his feet, and his eyes open wide as he exerts it, sending a shock wave across the training room. That shit looks clean. He looks down at his hand, saying finally he's completely mastered the young clan's movement art, and with this movement art, he can stimulate his muscles with energy and compress it, and that his body cannot get any stronger than it is now and he wonders if it will make his lifespan longer. He starts to think about the movement art, and we see him telling his older brother that he created it. It wasn't from scratch though, and he simply remodeled their clan's exclusive martial art. His brother thinks about it and tells him not to take it the wrong way, but it would be better if he did not tell anybody about this. Yongshan asks why, and we see him telling his brother who got into the Zhongnan clan, he asks what he would do if he experienced energy deviation while learning it and died, and if he will take responsibility. Yongshan made a face as if he did something wrong, and then even Deem Young was yelling at him, asking how dare he mess with the clan's movement and the clan's martial arts, asking if he thinks he is the founder or something. Again, Yongshan makes a face as if he did something wrong, and he turns away. A clan founder is someone who creates martial arts and is the founder of a martial group. He's never thought of himself as anyone like that, and he never thought about creating martial arts. He just wanted to become healthy and live with everybody for as long as he possibly could because he loves his family. He hears some people outside saying that it's about time they arrived, and he wonders where they're all going, and then he recalls that today is the day the martial masters of the Zhongnan clan visit. The Zhongnan sect is one of the nine great sects in the world, one of the twin walls that are known as the strongest groups in Shanxi, along with the Mount Hua sect, the place where the sword deities are at. And he wants to meet them in person. We see him asking somebody a couple of nights before, if there's a reason that he can't show his face to the clan guest, suggesting maybe it's because he caused his mother's death. The assistant tells him it's only the patriarch's order, and Deem Young wonders why his father ordered it. The assistant then apologizes to him, and Yongshan looks sad. 
He begins to walk forward, saying maybe if he sees it from afar it'll be okay, and he's sure he'll be able to learn something from such skilled masters. The gates open up as a lot of the family's practitioners and servants wonder who's coming in, saying that maybe it won't be the Sky Sword Dragon, but at least an elder, and it would be a real honor for their clan if one of them were to visit. We see Deem Young and the family all ready to greet them, and somebody yells saying they're coming in. In the back of the crowd, Yonchen watches with the servants. A woman begins to enter, and as soon as she takes a step in, the air changes, and everybody notices her ears, as she is called a noble race, aka an elf. Yonchen explains that the noble race is known in books to be a mysterious race that can live on forever, and humans think of them as deities, and that energy around her is the core energy condensed in one's body, but it's being exuded naturally from her. Everybody is surprised, and Deem Young says he's utterly honored that they would visit their shabby clan and laughs, and he introduces himself to her. She's grateful for such a warm welcome, and she introduces herself as Yo Il Shin, an elder of the sect. Deem Young is surprised that she would be an elder since she looks so young, and then bows, as so does everybody else, and he says he is sorry for not being able to recognize the deity in front of him. She tells him to raise his head because she's not here to boast her status. He continues laughing nervously, saying she's come such a long way, and he apologizes for this respect once more, and he can't believe he kept one of the sword deities of the Zhongnan sect waiting outside, and he'll quickly let her in. Yongshin is just curious about how long she has lived, and she begins to follow Deem Young. While she's walking forward, she can feel Yonchen glaring at her, and she looks over at him. He's surprised that they made eye contact, and he quickly greets her. Deem Young wonders why she stopped and turned, and says that that is his third son. Il Shin says that he has really bright eyes, and he looks smart, and Deem Young laughs, saying he's sorry, but his third son is not very mannered. She asks what he means, and Deem Young says that it's embarrassing, but he's a troublemaker in the family. Yonchen just heads back to the training area saying that he has gained a new perspective after seeing her energy. He had nowhere else to climb after training in his clan's movement arts, and he was wondering what he should do, and he unsheathes his blade, looking at it, saying he guesses it would be good to try training with swords. As the night begins to fall, Il Shin's servants say this place is better than they thought, and with this much earth energy, the Tyrant Sword tribe would want this place. Il Shin says they'll definitely come here, so it'll be good for them to plan a counterattack, but that'll result in the sacrifice of this entire clan. Her servants ask why they don't just attack them before they cross the walls, and she thinks it would be nice if that happened, but she explains to them that within the Tyrant Sword tribe, there are those known as the Thirteen Skies, and they're all hella strong just by themselves, and they shouldn't let their guards down, and they need to keep their sword aura sharp. She takes a sip of her tea, as she can't stop thinking about Yonchen, saying that he clearly stood out among them, and she finds it strange. We see a blue aura from the training hall that night. As Yonchen is still there meditating, and he feels his Baihu acupoint open on the top of his head, and he wonders why it's so open. Although he wasn't able to meditate for a year, since he focused on training his body via his clan's movement arts, the amount of energy that goes through his head has gotten even greater than before. At this rate, he thinks he'll have less than five years before he loses consciousness, and if that happens, that means he has less than five years to live, because it would lead to him in a vegetative state. A chill runs down his spine as he genuinely feels terrified. He opens the training hall and walks outside, looking up at the moon, saying even though he's completely mastered his clan's movement arts, he can't stop this. He then suddenly senses something, which makes him no longer feel relaxed as he glares over, wondering what's going on, as there is an ominous energy from the other side of the wall. He grabs his blade and quickly runs over, saying something's off, and the closer he gets, the stronger the scent of blood is. It is also way too quiet. He sees an orange barrier blocking the door and heads straight through it, saying that it is a trap formation. He then immediately stops running as he is surprised by what he sees, all of the clan's practitioners and servants dead on the floor, as they have been brutally murdered. He says that he can't believe he didn't realize something like this was happening within the manor. He makes his way through the bodies, saying it must have been because of the trap formation, as one of the servants' faces is filled with fear, as there are still tears on her face, he closes her eyes, wondering if the culprits are that much stronger than everybody else. He hears a voice saying that he can't believe somebody's alive, and they call him a fool, saying if he managed to stay alive, he should have just stayed hidden instead of crawling out. The whole group looks over, saying that they guess he just got unlucky and they should send him to the afterlife. They all have red hair except the bald dude. Yonchen glances up at them, and Baldi says he's only killing him because he was ordered to, so don't blame him for this. He begins to concentrate his aura into his hand, but Yonchen doesn't plan to let this happen. 
He quickly gets into his stance as Baldy comes in with a palm strike. Yonchin grabs onto the back of the man's arm, and the man immediately realizes this is bad, as Yonchin crushes the bones in his arm with just pure strength alone, causing the man's arm to rotate and warp as he lets out a scream. But Yonchin's facial expression does not change as the man drops to the floor in pure agony. Everybody looks worried as they turn to see their comrade holding his pretzel-fied arm. Yonchin begins to release his energy now, and they unsheathe their blades, asking who he is while sweating nervously. He holds up his blade, saying he is the third son of this clan. Yonchin begins to slowly walk forward as he is releasing bluish lightning from his feet. Baldi begins to stand up and starts yelling at him. He goes to palm strike with his other hand, calling him a bastard. Before he can even react, Yonchin quickly lobs his head off. Baldi didn't even react to it, as all he sees is Yonchin's body tilting sideways. Bro got ahead of himself for real. The other red-haired dudes are all surprised at how fast he drew his blade. But of course, Yonchin doesn't give them time to act, as he uses something called the scripture of origin ability, cutting off another one's head. One of the men screams instead of swinging his sword. Yonchin capitalizes on that, cutting him diagonally in half. He then charges at the final two. One of them raises his blade but loses his arm. The other, loses his head. Yonchin turns around to finish the guy whose arm he cut off and thrusts his sword forward, stabbing the man straight through the chest. The man looks at the blade in fear, but Yonchin just looks pissed. He pulls the blade out, and the blood from all the bodies begins to fly out as it happened so quickly they couldn't even react to the movements in front of them. They all drop to the floor in perfect unison. Yonchin walks back out to the servants and sighs, saying this was his first time training the delightful sword, but he gets how it works now. He hears a voice saying that's pretty impressive, and he looks over as a new group of people are walking in, and he's confused. One of the men says, but it's not really much to write home about, as these are all idiots and they lost because they let their guard down. Yonchin wonders what's the deal with them as they're wearing a different uniform. But the man continues yapping, saying it's still a little surprising, asking how he could be so good despite his young age, asking if he trained the delightful sword all his life. Yonchin asks if they are from the blood flame cult, and he says no, those are the dudes he just killed, and they are from the tyrant sword tribe. He can't believe both of them are here. He explains that the 13 skies are said to be the most powerful and cruel groups in all of Muran. He can't believe that both of them, which are part of the 13 skies, would be here together. He asks what business the two organizations of the 13 skies would have here. Bandana Bro says it's none of his business, and Yonchin smirks. He says this since they are answering his questions rather than attacking him. He wonders if they know about him. Bandana asks what he means and just stands there waiting for his reply. Yonshin asks if he knows that his family is a part of the desolate fortress, the best branch sect in Murim. That's why if they kill him, it would be a pain for them even if they are a part of the Tyrant Sword tribe. But before they can even answer him, a giant explosion is seen from the wall as a man gets sent flying through the air. We get a better look as he is one of the dudes from the Jongnan sect, and Yonshin surprised, that the assistant is spitting up blood. He then looks up to see Eel Shin flying in from above, dodging an attack. She glances down at him and he wonders what's going on. She manages to regain her footing but is clearly pained as she uses her sword for stability to stay upright. Her ear is bleeding. He says if one of the sword deities is in such a pitiful state, the enemy must be quite powerful. A man begins to come from the other side of the wall, and a chill instantly runs down Yonchen's spine. Il Shin looks up as we see a man levitating over the wall. He slowly starts to descend and walk forward while releasing a dark purple aura. Yonchin wonders who this is as there is a very strong dark energy around the man. As if the man exudes pure death energy, something akin to the human embodiment of it. Yonchin wonders who he is. Mr. Bandana and his brothers are also surprised. The man glances over at Yonchin, which makes his head feels light just from the eye contact. Bandana instantly gets on his knees, greeting the tribe leader, as do the rest. Yonchin says he can't believe that the tyrant sword tribe leader is here. He is the man who reigns over the Tyrant Sword tribe, he is considered a harbinger of disasters here in Zhang Hu. He wonders why a man who is considered an equal to a patriarch of one of the nine great sects is in a place like this. He looks over at Il Shin and her assistant, who is heavily injured, and says either way, at this rate, they are as good as dead. He lets out a long-winded sigh and says he might as well test himself if he is going to go out. He stomps off the ground, destroying it, charging forward extremely quickly using his aura. Bandana is caught off guard as he didn't expect such movements. Yonchin readies his blade, and Bandana goes to unsheathe his, but he is too slow as Yonchin already thrusts forward, 
stabbing him through his chest as he couldn't even react. Both Il Shin and the tyrant tribe leader are just watching. Bandana draws his final breath, and then Yonshin lets his corpse onde sword fall forward, then asks the tribe leader if he thinks he can kill him even if he were to do something like this in his face. Everybody else draws their blades, calling him a bastard, but the tribe leader says that's enough and that his spirit is better than all of those here combined, and everybody is just surprised, even Il Shin. His men realize that if he is praising the enemy, this is pretty bad, and the tribe leader says that he will let him live, and Yonchen says it's more like he can't kill him. He reaches for his blade, pulling it out of bandana, saying because he knows that he is the only grandson of the former Divine Sword Squad, and leader of the desolate fortress. Il Shin is surprised about who Yonchen's grandfather is and says that he is the best in the desolate fortress. The tribe leader says that it's definitely not a good idea to get involved with the desolate fortress, but that is not the reason that he is letting him live and that he just likes him. And if he didn't have any connections to the fortress, he'd have made him his disciple. Il Shin and his men are surprised that he is rating him this highly. The tribe leader raises his sword and stabs him to the ground, saying that he will give him one day to leave this place. He does not permit any other sects or clans to set foot on this land. He slowly walks away after saying what he has to. He then stops for a second and turns, saying that he will always be open to have a duel with Yonshin, and he can come and find him when he is ready to get revenge. Yonshin just continues to mean mug him, even as he exits the manor. He starts to paint a vivid image in his mind of his back. Something for him to chase after. Yonshin finally makes his way inside and looks down at his father, who is struggling to breathe. Yonshin tells his father that he is here. His father stretches his hand up towards him, asking why he is so strong and how he lived. Yonshin tells his father that it is due to the movement art that he created and mastered. His father is surprised that he created it. He recalls back to when he tried telling him before and how he just yelled at him, asking if it was from back then. Yonshin says yes. His father looks up, realizing how much of a fool he was. He says that it is the sacred art created by the young clan. He begins to cry, saying that he was so ignorant and foolish as he overlooked the fact that his third son created a sacred art. He tightens his grip on Yonshin's hand and says that he definitely has the qualities of a founder as tears roll down his face. Yonshin looks down at him with sad eyes, and his father's eyes begin to lose focus. As his final words acknowledge that he was his son, he then closes his eyes. Yonshin realizes now that his father has passed, and his brother starts to scream out for his father as Yonshin stands up. We see the assistant holding his younger sister, and he calls out to Yonshin. Yonshin asks how his sister, Hey Ah, uh, is, and the steward says that she is safe. She is just sleeping after her AccuPoint got blocked. It seems it was blocked to knock her out, she was hidden so the killers wouldn't find her. Unlike everybody else, Yonshin looks down at his family's corpses and calls out to his brother, saying that he needs to raise Hei Ah and the Jongnan sect. She has an exceptional affinity with the five elements, so they'll definitely take her in. His brother asks about him, and Yonchen says that he'll look after himself. Il Shin then calls out to him, and they make eye contact. He asks if she's leaving now, and she says yes. Now that the Tyrant Sword tribe has gotten involved, she must report this to the sect without delay. She asks Yonchen what he's going to do and if he is going to the desolate fortress where his mother is from. He says yes, as he doesn't have anywhere else to go where he can grow stronger. She asks how about he come back with her to Jongnan Mountain, as she would strongly recommend it. He says that he is truly honored to receive an offer from an elder of one of the great sects. She then adds on that she intends to recommend that he become the sect leader's disciple. His eyes immediately change, and her assistants are surprised too. He asks if that's even possible, and she says it would be possible only for him. He wonders why, and he explains that the direct disciple of the Jongnan sect leader would be able to learn the absolute sacred art of the clan, and that the leader is one of the top 10 martial masters in the entire world. He puts his hands together saying that he won't forget the kindness that she has shown him, but he must apologize. She sighs then smiles, telling him not to worry about it, saying that she simply wanted someone talented like him, and that's probably what the Tyrant Sword tribe leader thought too. He says again to forgive him, but she says it's fine and that the doors of the sect will always be open for him. Hopefully, he remembers that. He looks hesitant, but then says he has a question for her. He says that he knows she's one of the older people among the noble races, and he asks if she knows of the method to get the fruit of the world tree. She's surprised and goes to ask him something, but of course we need more plot, we learn that the fruit of the world tree is protected by the desolate fortress leader, whom the emperor has acknowledged as the king and a peer. It is said to give eternal life and youth to those who eat it. It is a treasure of the heavens. So surely, if he ate that, his lifespan would increase, so he would be able to live longer than five years. 
She says that she hasn't even lived half her own lifespan, so she has no authority over the world tree. All she knows is that the desolate fortress leader is able to give people that. He says in that case he must go there. She warns him that it won't be an easy journey, as it's a sacred item even for her and her noble race. He says he doesn't know any other way, so it can't be helped. All he can do is become the Divine Sword Squad leader and achieve great feats. She puts her hands together out of respect, saying that she'll cheer him on from afar. She turns, saying that she needs to take her leave to update the sect. She says her assistant, the Cliff Swordsman, and the Neutral Spirit Fist, who looks like a fish, will help clean up this place. And then she heads out, and he pays respect to her once more. Morning finally comes and shines down at the manor as we see they dug graves in the woods. He thanks both of the assistants, saying he's glad that they helped. They say it's all for the sake of the clan and that they played a part in this tragedy after all. Yonshin's brother then calls out to him, he looks really regretful. He says an apology won't cut it for everything that has happened to him and the clan. When they meet again, he'll try to be an older brother to make up for his shortcomings so far, and he hopes that he'll do his best to survive. Yonshin warns his brother that he is not exceptional, at least that's the way he sees it, and he's going to have to train like his life depends on it. His brother doesn't even get angry and says that he'll remember his words. Yonshin looks down at his sister, never mind that's his niece, and he tells his brother to protect her. He then asks the chief steward where he is going, and he says there are small branches of the Yung clan in various places, and since the bloodline of the clan is alive, he'll look after the remaining assets. Yonshin then says he knows he's heading to the desolate fortress and he hopes they can meet from time to time. Since the steward knows martial arts, he'll be of help, and the steward bows, calling him master. Yonshin says that he hopes he lives a comfortable life and he should take care of himself. The steward's surprised by his kind words, and then Yonshin turns, taking his leave from the group. The steward still can't believe what he just heard and wonders if anybody else in the Yung clan has ever said something like that to him. It jumps to Yang Yang as we see the city streets bustling, and Yonshin is being shown upstairs at an inn. He makes his way to a table, puts his bag down, and glances over at the city, saying that he's finally here. In the distance, we see the desolate fortress, and we hear some men in the other room saying that the fortress is truly incredible. People from all over the central plains would gather here with big dreams due to them. The boss of this instruct the jackpot, and he says he's completely out of liquor to sell. Another one says it's been really chaotic in the restaurant these days. The martial artists that come in here to take their entrance exams are always drunk. Yonchen wonders if there is such a thing as an entrance exam to the fortress. Somebody approaches him, asking if he is here to take part in it. His name is Han Wan Chang. They stare at each other for a second, and Yonshin asks if he is, but doesn't answer his question. The man says he forgot to introduce himself, and he is fascinated to see a challenger younger than himself. He says he is from a very far away city in the outskirts of Shanxi. Yonshin introduces himself as well and where he is from. The guy says since he came from somewhere nearby, his journey must have been easy, and explains a how he had to fight green forest bandits and swim against the pirates of the pirate fortress and that their water martial arts were legit aids to deal with. Yonchen starts to get flashbacks as we see his sword is bloodied and there were bandits on the ground in fear. But he slept peacefully. He takes a sip of his drink, saying his journey was indeed pretty easy. Wan Chang turns around and begins to look around the inn, saying they should become friends and share information about the test if they have any. Yonchen asks what he means by test, and Wan Chang looks a little confused, saying it is known as the desolate fortress trial and is quite different from the usual martial arts tests. Just as how those who want to become a government official must be well versed in both martial arts and literature, there is a test for joining the desolate fortress, which is why so many people are gathered here. No matter if you have foundations or not, the moment you join them, opportunities and teaching will be provided to you, and it's no wonder that everybody is trying to come here. There are countless people who have learned various martial arts so that they can pass the test as well. Yonshin sets his cup down, saying that people would say that if you want to take on the world with just one weapon, go to the desolate fortress since the imperial family that rolls over the central plains would make their move in order to control the martial arts groups. All of the elixirs and advanced martial arts gathered from all over the world are waiting inside of the fortress. Wan Chang says that some people say that the great sects with traditions are better, but they don't know anything. Asking how could martial groups created by mere commoners be stronger than the fortress? If that's possible they would be able to create an empire. Yonshin says he sees, and Wan Chang continues, saying almost nobody has been able to pass the fortress trial in one try. The chances are 1 in 1000. They are usually next generation leaders or reputable martial arts clans that are rising in the world and gaining fame. That brings him to this, 
asking if he would like to take the test with him tomorrow. Yongshan agrees, and Wan Chang is just surprised by how easygoing he is. He says that he knows it might be confusing on his first try. Bro continues to show that he is fluent in Japanese. Yongshan instantly tunes him out and looks off towards the fortress, saying that he is glad he can join as long as he passes the test. He didn't want to ask his mother's family for help since he doesn't know where they live or what they look like. The next day, we see a flag raised high in the sky as Yongshan and Wan Chang are walking towards the fortress. Wan Chang says it's time to go. Yongshan is excited to see what the desolate fortress will hold for him. Later, we see Yongshan being given a plaque, and someone says that he's number 13. Yongshan says okay and looks around at the competition, gauging them as there are also people there to judge. Wan Chang starts to explain that the first exam is just about getting the supervisor to accept your plaque, but you'll fail if he tells you to return it to the receptionist. The second exam is a tournament. Yongshan asks if there's a third, and Wan Chang thinks about it, saying it's an interview with the fortress's lord. Yongshan is surprised by that, asking if he really means with the lord himself. Wan Chang says yes. Then explains that there are martial artists who come to Yang Yang just for that chance. A conversation with an absolute master like him is an incredible opportunity, and they hope to receive some kind of profound understanding from talking to him. Yongshan looks at the tournament and says that he'll take note of that. One of the interviewers says the first exam is about swift sword arts. And to demonstrate one swing with the fastest sword technique you own, and he shall watch and judge it. Wan Chang immediately yells, saying he'll go first, and the receptionist gives him approval. Wan Chang says he got nervous and did it. Yongchen says this seems simple enough. Wan Chang begins to draw his blade, and Yongchen says he's got a well-polished spirit, he can tell he's strong and he's even stronger than some of the vagabonds he saw on the way here. Wan Chang exhales and then quickly draws his blade, swinging it horizontally, leaving a little bit of smoke in the air too. Some of the spectators say this man is a bit different, and they didn't even see him swing, only the smoke from after it. Wan Chang audibly gulps, looking up at the judge, wondering what he will say. The judge thinks about it and says it's not bad, telling him to give him his plaque. Wan Chang's happy and then, thanks him. Wan Chang gives Yongchen the thumbs up, telling him good luck. Yongchen doesn't look worried at all and he slowly walks up. Some of the people in the crowd are surprised that he's so young, and they compliment his guts, asking if he's from another province, as where else would he be able to show sword techniques in front of a martial artist of the desolate fortress? Even receiving one piece of advice is incredibly precious. Yongshin stops walking and looks at the judge and nods his head, as does the judge, who tells him that he may begin. Yongshin immediately opens his eyes as the aura gets tense, and we see his blade is already behind him. His aura begins to disperse, and then immediately a strong gust of wind follows. The judge is left impressed, everyone else is confused, wondering what is going on. Yongshin looks at his blade, and the crowd starts to ask when the hell the sword moved. Wan Chang is left speechless. The judge wonders what to say as well and then says that the future of the desolate fortress is right here as Yongshin sheathes his blade. Everyone is surprised at how highly he is being valued, and the judge tells him to hand over his plaque. He looks at it, maybe the number is important, or he's just remembering which people stood out. Telling him to be on his way. He calls for the next one up, and Yongchen takes his leave as Wan Chang quickly follows from behind and asks if he is perhaps the son of a famous family. Yongchen asks if that changes anything, saying that after entering the desolate fortress, he heard that all that matters is martial arts talent and effort. Wan Chang asks if he really plans on passing the trial, and Yongchen says surely that's why everyone else is here. Not just him, but Wan Chang as well. Wan Chang says that he's right and then bows, saying that he'll be on his way, thanking him, and then leaves with a very serious expression. All Yongchen wishes for is that Wan Chang passes the second exam too. Back at the inn, Yongchen is meditating with the windows open. He remembers Wan Chang saying the second exam is a tournament where you compete against others with martial arts and he has three weeks until the second exam. Considering how close it is, the correct choice is to train his skills. He will train his movement arts, his rapid sword arts, as well as his scripture of origin and focus on strengthening his movement technique. He trains until the sun fades out, and then we get a whole three-week time skip. A man from the fortress is leading Yongshan and the rest of the pack, saying until they are called, examinees should wait here. He heads towards a door and opens it. While everybody else watches, some of them say it even makes them feel discouraged, and they heard that the white martial arts outfit signifies an elementary level martial artist, but yet his energy is so strong and it's obvious that even just wearing white means your future is guaranteed. Wan Chang calls out to Yongshan and asks if he's gotten taller. Yongshan says that he also looks like he's much healthier, and Wan Chang says that he did accomplish something, tapping his chest. 
He looks down at Yonchen, saying he would like him to remember that winning is not what's important in this exam. Even just having one of the two matches of the tournament is enough to catch the eye of one of the masters who will be watching. Although that's the hardest part. Turns out Bro has already failed. Yonchen asks if that means you can win a match and still fail, and Wan Chang says yes. The problem is that the exam supervisors are going to have a higher standard today. Yonchen asks why, and Wan Chang says he heard that the White Keelan is competing at the trial today. Yonchen asks if he means the White Keelan from Namgung, and Wan Chang says yes, and we learn that he wiped out a notorious group of bandits before he was even 15. He also beheaded the sword's master of an unorthodox faction called the Shrouded Assassin. Wan Chang continues, saying there were even rumors that he defeated all of the upcoming fighters at the 8th Great Family's Dragon and Phoenix tournament when he was only 18. Yonchen asks what he's lacking if he already has such high martial prowess, why is he trying to join the desolate fortress? Wan Chang tells him that it's because he's the child of a concubine, so he can't become the patriarch, and if one rises to the position of the desolate fortress's lord's captain, it's of a similar standing to a patriarch of the 8th Great Families. As the desolate fortress maintains the order of Zhang Hu in the central plains, after all. Yonchen gives him a look as if he understands, and then the examiner quickly calls out for Yonchen to step up. Wan Chang looks nervous, but Yonchen does not, and he says that he hopes to see him again here inside the fortress. Wan Chang is surprised and then screams yes as Yonchen walks forward. Inside, there are martial masters of all types ready to watch the fight. Yonchen's opponent draws his blade, but of course, Yonchen only watches, and the judge announces to begin. The man begins to laugh, and Yonchen wonders what's the deal. The man says not even knowing his final destination is mere despair, and he must be a moth that's struggling around a flame. Bro is a Murim Shakespeare. He goes to ask Yonchen if he knows who he is, only to have his face get absolutely dented because Yonchen hit him with the sheath of his blade, sending him flying. The man thuds onto the ground. Bro is fugly, and Yonchen is just confused that it was so easy. They quickly start dragging the Yugo away as Yonchen watches. The other martial artists don't really seem interested in the fight, and then one man smiles, walking forward, asking if he can begin now. Yonchen wonders what's going on, as the man looks very different from the last guy. Yonchen realizes this must be where his test begins as they are now in the middle of the ring together with the judges. Some men in the back say finally, and they wonder who will take him, as the squad leaders are going to be fighting over him. Some of them say he's even stronger than they are, and they would not expect any less from a Namgung. Yonchen realizes based on the name that this guy must be the White Keelan, and the spectators wonder if they are going to be able to witness the Boundless Heaven technique today. Yonchen says that he looks like he's five years older than he is, but it's not a level that he can't reach. Thanks to his family's martial techniques, he is more fit than he is, but he is below him in other aspects. The man puts his hands together and introduces himself as Namgung H. Washin, and he says that he's mainly trained in the Boundless Heaven technique and the Infinite Steps, and he unsheathes his blade, telling him it's nice to meet him. Yonchen does the same by putting his hands together and says that he's trained in the Jung movement art. H. Washin is then confused, asking him if he's not going to draw his blade. Yonchen puts his hand on it and then rotates his body, giving him a glare as if he is ready. The man then gives a nod as he understands, and then starts to channel aura into his blade. Yonchen readies himself, saying that the main essence of the technique he has been practicing recently is unpredictability. An unexpected main attack in the midst of an unpredictable rhythm, and if it works, he should be able to get him to let his guard down. Yonchen sits there waiting for the moment as the air begins to get really tense with everybody watching in anticipation. The judge yells to begin, and then immediately we hear their swords collide as Yonchen's blade gets broken and is sent flying across the room. Yonchen continues glaring at Hwashin, who looks a bit taken aback by the speed. Hwashin's sword falls onto the ground, and everybody is confused, wondering what that was. They all say that Hwashin won so fast, and that shit was crazy, but some other people start to have a very different view and look nervous. Hwashin looks down at his blade and realizes and points it to the ground, admitting that he has lost. Yonchen is surprised, and some of the other martial masters ask him what he means. The men from earlier say that Yonchen's sword was hella scary and that he is definitely younger than Hwashin too, wondering if maybe he can't use true energy with his techniques yet, and that they didn't know that there was a hidden master and they are scared of what he will become. The judge asks him if his name was Yonchen, and he says yes. He then points, saying there is another garden if you go north from here and to wait there. Yonchen says okay and then puts his hands together, telling Hwashin he would love it if they could duel another time. Hwashin says that's what he was about to say too and he looks forward to it. Yonchen looks at him as if he learned something, then quickly heads out of the building. 
we see other people already waiting, and they all look back at him, surprised that somebody so young passed, and they thought that H. Washin would get in first. Yonchin says that he knew there would be no chance of winning if the fight dragged on, which is why he is the most extreme form of the delightful sword. However, because H. Washin's sword was imbued with his true energy, his broke. It was a failure on his end for being too rash with his attack, but for him to admit his defeat, he guesses that is the nobleness of a renowned family. He recalls how the others mentioned that he can't use true energy. We learn that the Yung clan is a third-rate branch clan, and if there was someone in the household that knew how to use such a skill, there was no way he would not have learned it, however, he knows it now, and he realizes how it should be used the moment he witnessed it. As he looks down at his hand, he begins to imbue his aura into his sword, saying he understands now that it isn't just simply putting the energy into it. He can use the true energy as a medium to become one with the sword. As it begins to vibrate rapidly, everybody hears the sound and looks over. I wonder if it sounds like a lightsaber, and they recognize it as sword resonation, saying that's impossible as he is so young, as we see it beginning to send out pulses of aura that are cute with the sound, and it kind of sounds like sonar. Yonchin says the sensation is as if his sword and body are united, and this must be body-sword unification. Bro is built different. Yonchin wonders about the new techniques he'll be able to use while in this state. As the aura begins to dissipate, he slowly opens his eyes and smiles while looking at his blade. H. Washin then congratulates him on his enlightenment, as we see him standing beside him. Yonchin is confused as he notices he has his hand on his blade, and that the rest are watching intently. He wonders if he was protecting him for fear that somebody might get in the way of his enlightenment. He tells H. Washin that he wasn't aware that he was protecting him and thanks him, congratulating him on passing the fortress trial, calling him Sir Nam Gung. H. Washin's taken aback and lets out a very loud laugh. Wan Chang says that he's here too, reminding him that he exists and he's not just a side character. Yonchin congratulates him too, and Wan Chang does the same. He asks if he knows that he's gotten a nickname. Yonchin asks what he means. Wan Chang explains that when someone has shown exceptional prowess or attracted attention, people would give them a nickname and call them by it. Unless it's someone who commits an atrocious or evil deed, most nicknames represent a huge honor for martial artists, just like Cliff Swordsman, the Neutral Spirit Fist, and the White Chi Lin. H. Washin says that he heard about it too, and Yonchin is confused, thinking all he did was take a trial. H. Washin tells him that they call him the Lightning Genius. Yonchin is surprised, but H. Washin explains that it is based on his talent of lightning. It's even more impressive that the martial artists of the Desolate Fortress are calling him that, which means that it's basically his nickname in the entirety of Zhang Hu now. Yonchin asks if he's sure they're not just mocking someone who's young and a little fast with his sword. H. Washin asks what he means by a little fast, saying that if he said that was just a little bit, yet he could barely react, he wonders how slow that would make him. Yonchin says that it's a name that he wouldn't have even dreamed of when he was doing the horse stance in the manor, and it doesn't have a bad ring to it. Somebody yells, telling everybody to gather around, saying only one trial remains. If they pass it, they'll join the fortress. Yonchin looks ready and glares up at the pagoda, saying that he's about to meet a living piece of history and one of the strongest martial masters, or rather, maybe even the strongest. Everybody heads inside and then comes out looking absolutely defeated. They laced his shit with fentanyl. Wan Chang looks worried, as the guy just zombies his way past them. Wan Chang says everybody's coming out pretty fast, and he wonders if the leader is just looking at their faces while talking. Yet another zombie, followed by yet another one. And finally, Yonchen is called, and he turns. Walking towards the door, Wan Chang looks worried. Yonchen says they told him to keep going until the top, and he slowly starts heading up the steps one by one until he's greeted with a giant door. It somehow opens automatically, and Yonchen begins to walk forward as he sees all sorts of decorations around the room. He then begins to feel a strange presence and looks up, surprised, as we see a green-haired person in a chair. He wonders if this is the leader that is meant to be the strongest in the world, and he introduces himself to her. The person then turns, and it is yet another elf. Yonchin waits to hear what she has to say, but all she does is glare at him, saying that he is of that child's bloodline. He asks what she means and if maybe she knows his mother. Her expression quickly changes, and she says it seems like he already knows what she means and that he is pretty bold. Yonchin doesn't even tremble, and she takes note of this, and he says that he is the grandson of the former Divine Sword Squad leader. She says that he's about to become a part of the Elder Council soon, and he's someone who is very obstinate. She continues glancing at him, saying that he seems to have a wound. He says it's nothing to be concerned about, and it's just trivial family matters. She says they aren't trivial, and it's just covered by his trained body, and he will probably live for around 15 years. 
She nods her head, saying it's true that this isn't something an outsider should comment on, and he should go seek out his grandfather first. He apologizes, but he says the transcendent air she carries as someone with absolute strength is a separate matter from her trying to interfere with his family matters. She smiles and sticks her foot out, slowly getting up from the chair, saying that she likes him. It's interesting that he doesn't bow down to anyone, even though he came here because he has something he wants. He's surprised, wondering how she knows what he wants, saying that maybe she found out that his upper meridian is abnormally wide, and he decides to go for it, asking if the fruit of the world tree would save him. She says while the facts about it aren't all inaccurate, he begins to grow more nervous, but she says yes, it's possible for him to get what he wants, and he says that he knew it, asking if he can get it. She tells him it depends on what he does. He sighs out of relief, saying that's good enough for him and thanks her. Then he remembers that this is a trial, asking if he is a martial artist of the fortress now. She smiles, saying yes and he may leave, and calls him the next Divine Sword Squad leader. He looks to see if she's jesting or not, and she gives him a soft, but warm smile, and as he's leaving, he says that he doesn't know if she's teasing him or not, or if she really sees the potential. He then turns, saying maybe she's inferring that he can get the fruit of the world tree if he becomes the divine squad leader. And if that's the case, at least he has a goal. If you've watched till the end comment, bug, to let me know. Subscribe for more videos like this, leave a like or a comment to help the channel out. Thanks for watching.